Thanks everybody and thank you very much Eva for asking me to come and speak today um, I really appreciate your time and attention for the next 12 minutes um, so please bear with me uh, uh, I'm not used to public speaking, I'm, well actually I'm used to public shouting and bowling, um, so I'm not used to like, trying to convince, so I've got something to convince you about tonight and I'll hopefully um, I'll do a good job of that, but if I don't please tell me why because I want to make it better. Um, so thank you for gathering here today to, to obviously discuss the two critical issues that are inextricably linked. Scotland's independence and the need for better addiction treatment. Those, the current treatment services that we have um, are under this false impression of going through this insane, insane, insane attempt to manage <coughs> the symptoms of addiction and the current system is failing miserably in Scotland. Our addiction experts possess significant knowledge about addiction and its consequences and they primarily focus on attempting to control and manage the physical symptoms of addiction so that's the biological aspect. We are neglecting the psychological and social aspects. However, these experts that are running Scotland's addiction treatment system possess limited understanding on how to effectively end addiction. The psychological and social dimensions play a crucial role in the process from recovery from addiction and I know because I've been in recovery for nearly 26 years now. After all, if addiction could be managed and controlled, which is what our system is trying to do, it would you truly be addiction. And it seems that the addiction sector is in complete denial of this. It's, it's, desperately striving to manage and control the symptoms while the very, the very nature of the condition renders it uncontrollable and unmanageable. If it was controllable and manageable, it would be the addiction. So we've got a whole industry in Scotland to thank God for bid how much money is in that industry. In fact, in my more cynical moments, I think it's a deliberate industry. Um, so as we delve into these topics, let us recognise that this audience is comprised of individuals who support independence. And I am bound by my position as the head of the charity to remain politically neutral while addressing these issues. So uh, the desire for Scotland's independence has been a long-standing aspiration for many of us in this room and as a nation we have a rich history and a unique culture and a distinct identity, Scotland's pursuit of self-governance deserves to be heard and respected and it still deserves it. The desire um, for independence, as we know, if we had it, would provide Scotland with the power to make decisions that directly address the needs and aspirations of its people allowing for the creation of policies that align more closely with our values as a population. Of course it would, but when it comes to addiction treatment, despite what you might have heard, Scotland already has these powers. We've got the same powers as England. But Scotland currently has five times more deaths than England with the same laws. But they have a very different treat treatment system. And Scotland's independence in time may offer an opportunity to address socio-economic disparities, promote social justice and invest in crucial areas such as healthcare and education and welfare services. But we must be honest, up until now, it hasn't. And that is tragic. What we're seeing are the consequences at the moment of a political elite that are made up of well-educated professionals who are skilled at manipulating public opinion and who are focused on bureaucratic management rather than true leadership. <coughs> Unfortunately, they've neglected the democratic foundations of Scotland over the last 15 years and they have used their power to control civil society through government connections and patronage. And what's been the result? Instead of a prosperous Scotland where poverty is eliminated and their communities thrive, the opposite has happened. I'm sure I speak for many of us when I say we desperately hope that this situation comes to an end soon. 
but I fear the consequences for living for decades. Now let us explore the proposed right to recovery bill that's going to come on your telly screens and your newspapers over the next few months, right? This bill is put forward by the Scottish Tories and I'm going to ask you tonight to give a fair hearing. The bill represents a significant step forward in transforming addiction treatment services in Scotland. Irrespective of our political affiliations, we can acknowledge the importance of addressing the pressing issue in all of the communities in Scotland of addiction and ensuring that everybody who's struggling with it has access to a comprehensive, recovery-oriented treatment system. We don't have that just now. The Right to Recovery Bill, <coughs> if passed, emphasised the need to treat addiction as a public health issue rather than just a criminal matter. It recognises the value of rehabilitation over punitive measures. You heard the ex, uh, policeman describe the bureaucratic process just for that one boy with a tenor bag. Horrendous. By pro providing a legal right to access person centred treatment, the bill aims to offer hope and healing to those who are battling addiction, empowering them to reclaim their lives and contribute to society once again. Moreover, we must not overlook the vital role that those who have experienced addiction have and who have successfully recovered play in addressing this issue. Our lived experiences and journeys to recovery bring invaluable insights into understanding the challenges and barriers faced by the individuals who are currently seeking help. Recovered individuals like myself can offer unique perspectives on how to improve addiction treatment services in Scotland and enhance our support systems. Our input should not just be pluralistic. Our input is crucial in designing effective, compassionate and evidence-based programmes that cater to diverse needs of all of those seeking help. By involving those of us who have successfully recovered in strategic planning, policy making and service development, we can ensure that our efforts are truly person-centred and holistic. But most importantly, our stories of triumph can serve as a beacon of hope for others and inspire them to embark on their own path to recovery. And my God, your communities need stories of hope. Combining the aspiration for independence with the principles to the right to recovery bill and the involvement of individuals with lived experience can lead to a transformative and integrated approach to Scotland's addiction treatment system. Regardless of our political leanings, we can all agree on the significance of investing in recovery-oriented care, which not only supports individuals, but reduces the burden on public services, promoting a healthier and more resilient society. Creating a recovery-focused addiction treatment system, however, is not without its challenges. It demands a comprehensive approach that involves healthcare professionals, social workers, community leaders, and individuals with lived experience in a collective effort Transcending political divides is necessary to address this issue effectively and provide the necessary support to those who so desperately need it. To achieve these goals, we must work together, acknowledging the importance of collaboration and putting aside partisan differences. Favour UK, the we charity that I work for, have been calling for unity since 2009 in the addiction sector. Access and choice to evidence-based treatment can be a legal right. This bill would make it a legal right, not just a human right. Human rights are not legislated rights. In some respects, human rights, when it comes to people suffering from addiction, are only worth the paper they're written on. Human rights are not always implemented, and legal rights offer protection from the law. Our bill would provide that protection, that access, and that choice of service. One fallacy that we see cropping up all the time is this idea that in the UK and Scotland in particular has, since 2010, had a treatment system that's focused on abstinence-based recovery or helping people get clean. It's not hard to find politicians or commentators claiming that that's what we have, but the reality is what's funded on the ground. The story of the last 15 years is that all services have been stretched and funding has been cut at a time when drug problems were diversifying and deepening. 
Within this overall picture, it is recovery and abstinence services that have been most depleted, and the vast majority of the £600 million spent by taxpayers on treatment system is still spent on opioid substitution treatment. These are often excellent harm reduction interventions, but most of that money goes on one-to-one -one case management. And in Scotland, that one-to-one -one case management is just paper pushing. It's important to distinguish political rhetoric from reality. We are mistakenly labelled as an organisation of proponents of abstinence-based only approaches by a vocal but very, very influential minority who are only interested in decriminalisation and legalisation, which stems from fear, maybe, of our voice being so loud, ignorance, but perhaps even more cynical motives such as massive profit to be made. We are, um, since our establishment in 2009, we've consistently advocated for unity and embraced the progressive middle ground. It's a tragedy that these false dichotomies are entrenched and the, these positions between harm reduction or abstinence continue to persist. So let us remember that Scotland's left leanings and supposed hatred of the Conservative Party cannot be allowed to influence men's support of this bill. By focusing on recovery-oriented care, we can, we can empower individuals, strengthen families, and build more resilient and compassionate communities for us all. While it's true that the Tories were the ones who brought this proposal to the table when no other party could or would, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should automatically support it. To dismiss it solely, though, because it's the Tories would be very tragic in our lives. Remember this bill, our bill, that's the hashtag, O-O-R-B-I-L-L, -L, came straight from the heart of people who had recovered, primarily being a guy called Stevie Bishop. We should evaluate the merits of this bill independently and make an informed decision based on its content rather than blindly rejecting it based on its association with a particular party. So when I phoned my pal today and I said I've been up to Perth to try and persuade the Alta members and their friends to support a Tory bill, she laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, I would ask you to remember it's not a Tory bill, it's our bill. Independence beckons us to a future where our decisions reflect the values and aspirations of our nation. Jimmy Reid, with his unwavering commitment to the welfare of workers and communities, taught us that Unity and solidarity can bring about transformative change. Together we can forge a Scotland that values its people, embraces its diversity, and nurtures a vibrant society. Sorting the wheat from the chaff has never been harder in this age of increasing fake news. Our bill, I can assure you, is the wheat. No amount of anti-stigma campaigning will change your treatment system. There's a massive anti-stigma campaign being Millions have been put in it by the Scottish Government to make us all feel sorry for people who are losing loved ones and you know people who are dying for addiction. Exploiting our grief and our pain will not change our treatment system. The right to recovery bill will change the law and the law will change our treatment system. In our pursuit of progress, we must not succumb to the hype and fallacies that surround us. We must recognise that the truth is right in front of us and separate it from the noise that surrounds this and many other critical issues of our day. We find ourselves in this unique position where our neighbouring country, England, boasts significantly lower related mortality rates when it comes to drug addiction. It's not due to some secret or inaccessible knowledge. The evidence is clear and the numbers do not lie. We can learn from their success and strive to implement a treatment system that truly works for all people, the same as it works for the people of Newcastle. We get five times more deaths in Scotland. It's the same drugs, it's the same impoverished communities, but their treatment system is different. The path forward may not be straightforward, and the academic community is still deliberating the evidence when it comes to decriminalisation and legalisation. But looking at places like Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, and much lauded Portugal, the evidence for success does not look good in any way or positive for the citizens who live there. 
However, this should not deter us from seeking practical solutions right here, right now. We must focus on giving everyone every chance and every choice to recover. We must navigate this complex to debate. Shape a brighter future for Scotland to stop the deaths. Don't forget, Scotland currently operates under a de facto decriminalisation policy already for personal use. And unlike a criminal justice approach, our focus is primarily on public health already. So don't let the politicians tell you that they're doing anything new. However, it's really important not to be swayed by exaggerated claims. The fact that England's got five times fewer deaths in Scotland indicates that their treatment system is far more effective. The solution is not elusive, it simply requires a commitment to practical measures. And we must remain, remain vigilant and critical of the political gains that have been played in Scotland on this issue. Too often politicians exploit this issue for their gain, using it as a tool in their endless jockeying for power. But we cannot afford to be swayed by their empty promises and rhetoric. We must focus on the facts on what truly matters, the well-being and the lives of our fellow Scottish citizens. The roaring spin machine out of the Scottish Government will continue to divert attention away the grand claims about decriminalisation and progress and legalisation as solutions to the escalating deaths instead of ensuring we've got an effective fit for purpose treatment system. It's still more enticing for our Scottish Government as it stands to use these dead cat and red herring tactics. It's crucial to recognise that true progress lies in making our treatment system truly fit for purpose rather than settling for empty gestures that fail to address the core problems at hand and that we are really fueling proxy debates about independence and playing political football with our loved ones' lives. There are two main reasons for this situation, diversion and revision. The Right to Recovery Bill, our bill, would put an end to the political football on this issue. Not on the other ones, but on this one it would. And I'm sure you know, divert. This tactic is referred to as a dead cat strategy and it involves re redirecting attention away from important issues by introducing a distracting element. <coughs> In this case, it's used to shift the focus away from the fact that Scotland currently has five times more deaths than England, despite having similar wars. But by highlighting something unrelated, like a dead cat on the table, the intention is to draw away from the concerning reality of Scotland's failing treatment system. The other tactic they're currently using on this issue is divide. This issue um, aims to frame the conversation in a way that polarises people into taking sides. So it creates a binary debate such as being for or against and in the latest uh, reiteration of this for decriminalisation. As a result of this, people becoming engaged in arguing about a side issue rather than addressing the real problem at hand, which is Scotland's treatment system is performing so poorly that we've got five times more deaths than our nearest neighbour. By diverting attention away towards a, a, a divisive topic, the focus shifts away from the underlying issue that requires attention and resolution. And obviously the Scottish Government have become extremely adept to this. One day I and others no doubt will write about to document it, and it's time to decide what your contribution will be. Our bill, by prioritising the welfare of our people, can create a Scotland that stands as an inspiring example of what a collective labour community can achieve, regardless of our individual stances on independence. In conclusion, let us remember the importance of considering diverse perspectives, respect, respecting the desire for independence and working together to improve addiction treatment services. As a nation, Scotland has an opportunity to shape its destiny and, pri and prioritise the well-being of its citizens. With those who have experienced addiction and successfully recovered playing a vital role in this healing journey. Let us also remember that Scotland's left leanings and supposed hatred of the, of the Conservative Party cannot be allowed to influence non-support of this bill. Let us heed the wisdom of Margot MacDonald who championed the importance of collaboration and inclusivity. 
As we navigate this path, let us remember that the power to shape Scotland's destiny lies with its people regardless of our political leanings. Collectively, we, collectively, we have the power to bridge political divisions and prioritise the development of a treatment system in a nation that genuinely serves the needs of our citizens. Rather than catering solely to the interests of politicians or lobby groups or financial interests, let us unite to build a country where the well-being of our people takes precedence, transcending partisan lines and working towards a shared vision for a better future for us all. Thank you so much for your time.